I will systematically explain to you the entire method of meditation. Why do we call it superconscious meditation? Most often you forget that method of meditation is very short, but the philosophy behind it and preparation for meditation is not known to all people. The students should understand the scientific law. If you throw a stone or rock, it will hit somewhere. Every action has its reaction. Why are you not benefited by the method? Why do you meditate for such a long time and then come out with a statement that you have not gained anything? What do you expect from meditation? What is meditation? Do you understand the whole process, method? should be understood first. According to the codifier of yoga science, Patanjali, the method of meditation is not that something which one immediately does. It's a seventh step In the ladder of yoga, in the ladder of yoga, it's the seventh step. It means you are not prepared to practice meditation, yet you pose to meditate. What should be the preparation of meditation? According to yoga science, Satu Uddirg Kale Nairantariya Satkara Sevitu Dhradabhumi To break the habit pattern, to change the grooves that you have created in your mind, you have to constantly practice meditation regularly, every day at the same time. Why at the same time? Why do we stress much on the time? Because your mind is conditioned by time, space and causation. Time is a great factor in your life. It's a great filter in your life. If you understand what a time is, perhaps you will learn to annihilate time. There is a saying of the Upanishads, Dutiya Dve Bhayam Bhavati. Why are you afraid of someone? Because you are two. But if there is only one, who will be afraid of whom? As long as you dwell on the plane of duality, I exist and others exist. Others are different from me my existence is different from others. I am a different human being. These creatures are different, so naturally you will be afraid. Yes, you are definitely different. Physically you are different, you look different, you speak in a different way, your language is different, your culture is different, your thought Patterns are different, 
But beneath all these changes, there lies something that is not different. Absolute reality, that absolute truth within us is not at all different, it's one and the same. Unless you reach there, unless you attain that reality, you'll see everything different, you will have that fears. Fear means acknowledging someone's existence, forgetting your own self. Not realizing one unity in the diversity. Not realizing one absolute here, there and everywhere. When you talk to somebody, you never feel that you are talking to yourself. You prepare yourself, you force yourself to talk to others. You lie to others because you think he's a different person. You see. So the day you come to know that there is one underlying principle, the truth, that reality, you will be free from fears. Fear is a great obstacle in the path of enlightenment. In enlightenment, what do you gain? What do you attain? You don't gain anything, you don't attain anything because you are already attained. It's already within us. Simply we have to be aware of that truth or reality. Before we become aware of that reality, we will have to fathom all the levels of life. We will have to cross the mire of delusion. We will have to cross many hurdles, many obstacles that we have created for ourselves. There is something between you and the reality, and that is called your mind. It's a great instrument, and it's a great hurdle. It's a great instrument when you want to do something in the external world. The moment you wake up your mind immediately works, functions with the senses. Because it has employed senses. And it starts functioning in the external world. But for knowing truths, the process reverses. You will see that life has two aspects, external and internal. We are trained to see, examine, verify and know things in the external world. No one teaches us how to look within, how to find within, how to see within, how to verify things within. So we remain outsider whole life. We do not understand ourselves, yet try to understand things in the external world. Things are not the way you see them. They are not, even scientifically. If you study physics, you will come to know everything is moving. And if you study your mind, you will come to know that your mind is clouded. So how clouded mind can take the data, is able to have the data from the external world, which is constantly moving, everything is moving. 
then. Everything is subject to change, death and decay. Constantly. How are you going to collect the data from the external world with the clouded mind that you have? You cannot stop this movement, this constant movement. You can only purify your mind. You can have concentration, you can have concentrated and one-pointed mind and then that mind is led within. So what do you need? You need to purify your mind. You need to concentrate your mind, for mind is constantly going out to the external world with the help of the senses too. Then mind is dissipated, it needs concentration, three. Then that concentration should be directed inward in fathoming the levels of your life. But mind also has limitations. And a time comes when mind doesn't function. It has done your work, its work. It's like a boat crossing a river. When you cross a river, you need a boat. But after that, you don't carry boat with you when you have to walk. Before you learn to meditate and concentrate and meditate and attain that state for which you are meditating, the state of calmness, the state of equilibrium, the state of balance, you have to prepare yourself. For any art, for music, for dance. Suppose your body is flabby. Now, if you do belly dancing, you will be hurting yourself. You sit down in meditation and you do not know what to do next. What to do next now? Suddenly you start repeating mantra. That doesn't help. Systematically, if you follow and tread the path, you will reach your destination. You will attain your goal. Provided you have systematic knowledge and you learn to practice your meditation systematically. This is very important. That which cannot be given by any other method can be given by meditation. Remember this. That which cannot be solved by anything, prayers can do. What do you do in meditation? You pray actually. It's a compact prayer. Very short, subtle prayer. You are constantly praying. Your mind is focused on the object within you and you are exploring and yet you are praying. With the help of that subtle prayer, you go to the center of consciousness from where consciousness flows on various degrees and grades. It's a method that leads you from gross to subtle, subtler and then the subtlest aspect of your life. Modern man has a problem. He always complains about time. I don't have time. You don't need so much time. You have time to go to bathroom for your ablutions, you have time to eat, you have time to gossip, you have time to talk, you have time to cry, laugh and do many things. How come you don't have time to sit in meditation? 
its dire necessity. It gives you freedom from many, many diseases. You invite diseases and you don't have control over your mind. Many, many diseases can be prevented if you learn to meditate. Even simply you imitate, don't meditate, just try to imitate how your meditator sits. Sit quietly. Even then that is therapeutic. How that sitting is therapeutic? Suppose you are not doing anything, you are not doing meditation, but just sitting quietly. Sitting, keeping your head, neck and trunk state in a relaxed position will help you, will give will relax, will give comfort to that section, that part of your body which is not normally under your control, autonomic nervous system, involuntary system. The muscles which, are, which do not get rest during sleep or by any other means, get relaxed, get rest, when you sit silently and quietly. Many methods which are being practiced in your country, in modern world, are just practices of relaxation, they are not practices of meditation. For meditation you have to train yourself. After coming out with flying colors from colleges and universities, there is another school you have to attend and that is called a School of Self-Awareness. When you do not have teacher constantly correcting you, telling you what to do and what not to do, where you will have to learn to train your mind and senses. Self-training is very important. There is nothing impossible in the world. If you understand your inner levels of life, there is nothing impossible. You can do wonders. The great men like Christ, Krishna, Buddha, all these great men, they were like us. They were born exactly the way we are born. They walked on the earth. They didn't do anything unnatural. Nobody could see things with ears. Nobody has, no Bible on the earth says, you see through your nose when you become a great Siddha or enlightened. What happens to you when you are enlightened? Because you see things as they are. Today you do not see things as you, they are. You don't have capacity to see things as they are. So when you see that in the past the history that explains about the great men, their deeds and achievements, say that self-discipline can help one in attaining the goal of life. What is the goal of life? If you do not know what the goal of life is, meditation, contemplation will be not useful. You should know what the goal of life is. 
You all say goal of life is to attain God. That's not true. This is here, say, you have heard it. You have read the book. Goal of life is not to attain God. Goal of life is to be free from all pains and miseries and bondages. A state which is free from all pains, bondages and miseries, that is goal of life. To remain constantly in a state of happiness is goal of life. To be happy, full of love, is goal of life. Now, if you are not happy and you attain God, you see God and you know God, it is of no use. If you are with God all the time and you are not happy, that is not a sign of seeing God. And if you are happy, you don't need God. You see. So what do you mean by God? God means that state of attainment where you are free from all miseries, pains and bondages. Yes, I am not non-believer of God. But if I believe in God and have full faith in God, then I should be free from all pains, miseries and bondages. And if I am still in the clutches of pains and bond, miseries, then I do not know much about God. Then I do not have faith in God. My mere beliefs will take off whenever I need them to help me. So be practical and systematically understand. And that is, learn to know thyself first thing. It will become very easy for you to communicate with others, to understand others, to understand life and its counterpart relationship. Life and the other part of the coin, other side of the coin, relationship. You have to understand yourself. First step. What do you understand yourself? You see, you are, you have a body. Are you body alone? He says, ask, he is going through dialogue, so he asks himself, Koham, who am I? Dehoham, am I only a body? Naham, Naham, Naham. No, that's not true. Dead, there is a dead body. That's also body. I am a breathing being too. But when you are in deep sleep and you have a body and you are breathing being, are you being creative? No. You are a thinking being, but during that time, your thinking is not brought into action. So you are not only body, a breathing being or thinking being, you are something beyond that. When you try to understand yourself, many mysteries are unfolded. Whatever the way you feel today, the way you understand things today, after knowing yourself, you will understand yourself in a different way. You see? First attainment is freedom from fears because then you'll realize that unity, one absolute in all, it's a great freedom. When I went to 
Salt Lake City in a monastery and I was asked to explain certain passages from the Bible. So I asked him, I said, we all are monks here. There is no outsider. May I ask you, if I slap you, will you give me another cheek? Come on, tell me truthfully. Yes. Be practical, they said, no. I said, but Bible says, if someone slaps you, give him another cheek. Do you follow Bible? I said, no. Said, How come you are a monk? Following Christian tradition. All these great sayings have some truth in it. But those truths are revealed to us when we start practicing. So yeah, can you explain what it is? I said, I will. When a child sits in your lap and slaps you, what do you do? You give him another cheek. Because child loves you. And you love the child. No matter what he does, you forgive. When you become father, then all these kicks, slaps and blows have no meaning at all. It's not violence at all. When Christ was crucified, it was not violence for him. For others, yes, it was. But for him it was not. Because he says, Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You see. When child is seated, he's sitting on your lap, slaps you, he doesn't know that he's slapping you. You give him another cheek. But when? When you become father. When you understand the reality in life. This person has said, you are a bad person. It happened with me once. I was traveling in South India in a train. So there was somebody sitting next to me. He was very naughty, educated person. One Swamiji was sitting. He had one dozen disciples with him. He said, Swamiji, have you conquered anger, your anger? He said, of course, I never get angry. Ask my disciples. And everybody said, no, 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 no. Our guru never gets angry. And I was observing that quietly sitting in a corner. He said, sure you don't get angry? He said, no. I cannot believe. Sir, do you get angry? He constantly asked him. Twelfth time because I was counting. <laughs> that Swami got angry and said, you stupid. He said, see, you got angry. Why such thing happens? Because we constantly identify ourselves with the objects of the world. We know how to take off, but we do not know how to land. And that's a very dangerous situation. If we know how to start the car, or we do not know how to stop it, it's very disastrous. We have learned how to take off, but we have not learned how to land. Because mind has employed senses, and it's a habit of mind to go to the external world, and function with the help of senses, but we have not trained our mind not to be with the senses, but to go to the deeper levels of our being. Whole of body is in the mind, but whole of mind is not in the body. Otherwise, 
You cannot think. If you record someone's speech, that, and then you record someone's five minutes thinking, it will take one week for you to record thinking. If you record one week's thinking, it will take many, many days. If you understand your thinking process and then understand the instrument, understand, try to go beyond it. Unconscious mind, you will find the world within you is far more superior and greater than the world you see in the external world. So great seers found out the way of going inside. You are safe when you go inside. You are not safe when you are outside. That going to the innermost level of your life in a systematic way is called method of meditation, not mere japa. When you are remembering mantra or suddenly somebody says, you stupid, you will drop your mala and give him a blow. That is not japa, you see. You remember the worst things when you meditate. All your suppressions come forward during meditation. You are sitting. Oh, I have not done some work in the office. I have not paid the bill. Such and such person has not given my money. I have to see this minister. I have to see this person. I have to see this person. All these. What are you doing? Are you meditating? You are thinking intensely during that time. So intense thinking is not called meditation. That's my point. So what do you do? Regularly you sit, but you sit for thinking. And then you put blame, or oh, nothing is happening in meditation. It is better that you prepare yourself. It's preparation. Why these rituals are you see, performed all over the world? Wash your hands, wash your face, sit like this, sit like that way. Why all this? These are called preparations. Ritual means preparation. There are seven schools in Indian philosophy. And in all scriptures, of those seven schools, one word is used, atha. You see, everywhere, atha. Atha yoga anusashanam. Now, yoga teachings are expounded. Athato Brahma Jagyasa. Now, we have a desire to know Brahman, the highest. In all six systems, this word has been used, Ath. Ath means of, now. Now, when you analyze this word, now, it means now, then, and therefore. O oh, student, you have come to me, now, then, and therefore, you are fit for this. Means you are prepared to take the path of light and life. Without preparation, you cannot succeed anywhere. You have to prepare yourself for meditation. That's my point. You don't prepare and just sit down and then hallucinate or then sleep or then worry. You see.
first thing that you should do is called sankalpa shakti how to gather together the will force within you i will do it i can do it i have to do it i am going to do it when you want to do something do it with all your might with mind action and speech if you do something half heartedly and then do not receive the fruits therein you cry first thing is determination it's not half an hour one hour two hours meditation that is going to help you it's quality that is going to help you and up to conscious mind it's very easy to do very easy to train the body to make it still very beneficial very helpful it's easy to establish serenity calmness in your breath when you learn to breathe diaphragmatically then equal breathing you learn breath becomes calm what next you do not know you start remembering japa now who do you do suddenly your boyfriend comes in front of you his image comes and you are remembering christ see you are remembering christ's name and here comes boyfriend's image it means your remembrance of mantra is that image do you know image within you is called imagination image with you within you is called imagination when you are imagining there are many many images going on inside you imagery is is there you see so when you are remembering cup 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 the cup will come in front of you suppose you are remembering ram ram or sham sham or any your mantra what do you imagine during that time what is the image for that name because every sound has its form this sound will create a form simple thing you are remembering your mantra what is the focal point for your mind there the teachers are lost the students are lost you are remembering mantra you see and you know that you are not doing well yet you have been doing because you do not know actually so you think it's better to do something you see at least you are free from the troubles you are a trouble creator during that time there is no trouble so that much benefit you are getting you see how to deal with the mind is a point that you should understand when you have learned to create that dynamic will that i will do first thing i will sit keeping my head neck and trunk straight i will sit straight for some time i will observe my body stillness through my mind now what will happen suddenly a thought comes rolls down from the valley of the past and that will definitely affect you if it is pleasant thought you will smile if it sad sad thought your face will droop put a hidden camera when you meditate and you will find you have made thousands of faces you have not meditated the thoughts are affecting you thoughts do affect you 
Thoughts affect your gestures, thought affects your facial, thought affects your writing, thought affects your speech, thought affects your whole life. Your actions are virtually thoughts. You see, first thing you should learn not to identify yourself with your thinking during that time. That's why the scripture says, withdrawal of the senses. Withdrawal of the senses means you should have command and control that my mind is not running out, not going out with my senses. To isolate mind from the senses is a point, but mind will be not isolated. If you do not give a right point to meditate, focal point, what should be the focal point for the mind? You have learnt how to sit immediately. That's why. Jain and Jajan only go up to this. There is a focal point for the mind is breath. Suppose you are focusing your mind on the breath, what do you do? What do you observe there? First thing you observe that your breath is not jerky. It's not noisy. It's not irregular. Many of the diseases, which are coronary heart diseases, are created by you, and then you go to doctor for cure, and you expect a little pill can help you. How that pill can break your habit patterns, I want to know. I know medical science. I have not seen any injection, any pill, any surgery that can help breaking your habit patterns. You will have to be aware of this fact. So first mind is observing this. No noise, no shallowness, no jerks, no irregularity. That which is very important in the breath, and that's why Buddhist school of meditation gives you a very solid something. When breath is calm and serene, then you observe that it does not create a long pause. Ordinarily, you are creating a pause. This is pause. Nobody spanks his child. Well, what are you doing this? I would. If my students do that in front of me, I would say, stop doing this. You are hurting yourself. If you throw a rock on me, I can tolerate. But if you constantly do it, I cannot tolerate, because I know the consequences, that you are going to hurt yourself. When parents do not have knowledge of this, how can they teach children? Not to create a long pause, not to allow that pause. When you are creating a pause, you are suspending the motion of your lungs, scientifically. Motion of lungs is like a flying wheel in a machine called body. If it is irregulated, the whole body is irregulated. So two, three times a day, as it is very important for you to take nutritious food, you should learn to Breathe, not to allow that pause, not to form that bad habit. Whenever you hear something sad, what happens? 
you immediately suspend your breath. Negativity, negative thought, negative thinking changes the breath patterns. You can see the patterns of the breath. The pens will dance, will create a bump when you are thinking something negative. When you are thinking positively during that time, your thoughts are not disturbed and a straight line will be drawn. So three times a day you should learn to breathe. But when you meditate, you systematically first work with your body and then with the breath. With the body you work that my head, neck and tongue is in a straight line. My muscles are not disturbing me. My subtler muscles are calm. Otherwise, twitchings occur. Body is like a child. Whenever you want to train your body, body rebels. And mind also rebels. Mind says, what are you doing with my body? I've been using this instrument for a long time and suddenly a Swami comes and teaches you something. Why are you doing this? You are so young, you can do it later on. Enough time in life. You see, you can learn meditation in old age. Mind will give you many such suggestions. You see. Because time is one of the conditions of mind. It's a magician. It will tell you, if you are a thief, it will encourage you to steal. If you are a good man, it will encourage you to do good things. If you want to be lazy, it will encourage you to be lazy. It is a magician. You will have to be very alert, gently train that mind, unruly mind. You will have to make it orderly mind. And it starts with body first. No need of hallucinating. Sit down for a few days, even months, no harm. It will give you great solace and comfort if you systematically go meditate. Otherwise, whole life you will be doing, nothing will happen. When you have learned not to create the pause, then you do not think of it. You learn to work with your conscious mind. What do you do there? Will you give it an object? If you give some odd object to your mind, you will observe the mind does not like that. Mind likes some pleasant objects. If you have a girlfriend, your girlfriend's object mind likes. Now try that. Think of the person whom you love. After a few minutes, few seconds, that object also goes away. Another thought comes. It is a habit of mind not to stick to one object. That's why it is called mind. Millions and trillions of thought patterns are traveling in the train that is called mind. So when first breath, first in first step breath, Jain and Jajan stop there. They don't try to go beyond mind. So what do they say? There is no mind. No mind theory. We say there is no mind, it's easy to say there is no mind. I don't exist. But when you are hungry, you rush to the kitchen. When you have some necessity, you go to that spot. And then you say, I don't exist. No. Thinking process is there. Let us try to study and understand it.
Now, my mother, God forbid, she doesn't exist, she is not in the world, is seriously ill. And doctor tells me to fetch medi medicine for her. It's an emergency medicine. Now, suddenly when I walk for the drugstore, towards the drugstore, there I find red light. I cannot cross. Do I have to observe the model number? Which car is running this side and that side? Or do I have to wait to cross the road? In such a case, with full determination you go for something and there you find some obstacles. You just wait and cross. Suppose you are lost there. That red light stops you and it stops you for a long time. And you could not fetch the medicine. What do you do? You lose your mother. Meditation is like that. You observe things, but you do not allow things to affect your mind and heart. Many of you suffer on account of emotional problems in day-to-day -day life because my husband did not smile today. So you are very sad. Why are you sad today? Let him not smile. Let him go to dogs. Hmm? No, he always used to give me a good smile in the morning and today he did not give me. So your whole day, and one day he smiles and says, you have made my day, have you? How much do you depend on the external resources to make you happier, to please you? And that becomes your habit. So what? You become reactionary. Try to understand what I am saying. You learn to observe. That, that observation is called witnessing. Now there you will have to use your determination. No matter what happens during meditation time, I look at you, do I disturb? Am I disturbed? I am very happy. You all are wonderful, beautiful and handsome. Now I close my eyes and I look the whole, I see the whole crowd in my mind. Am I happy? No. There is a difference. The same thing which you see in the external world does not make you unhappy. But same thing comes in your mind will make you unhappy. Well, I am not sitting here to see your faces in meditation. I am here to see you and I am happy and that's what I am doing. But if I sit in meditation, I am not sitting there to see your faces. So suddenly, what am I doing? Another face will appear. What am I doing? Another image will appear. There is no end. You cannot stop mind. Many of you think, let us stop thinking. To stop thinking is called meditation. That's not true. Anyone who thinks that to stop, trying to stop thinking is meditation, let him forget that that is not called meditation. Here you should use to let go. Allow mind to go. Let it think the way it, you are observing. You are not identifying yourself with that. If an unpleasant thought comes, you are observing. Pleasant thought comes, you are observing. You are not being affected by any thoughts. That is actually called introspection, inspecting within. Being witness and not being involved. Ordinarily you are involved. I am talking to you, I am involved. If I am planning to do something, I am involved. But during meditation you learn not to involve. 
with your thinking process by understanding to let go. All thoughts are going on in the train that is called mind. I am observer, I observe. You become observer and you tell yourself, I am not going to be involved, no matter what kind of thought, what type of thinking is there. Nothing is going to affect me, you, because you have decided that. Even the worst thought pattern comes, will not affect me. Even the best thought pattern comes, will not affect me. You do it with your conscious mind. Conscious mind is that part of mind which you use in your daily life when you are awake. In your waking state, the portion of mind that you use is called conscious mind. From where those thoughts are coming? Because you are not using the external aid your senses. They are coming from the basement, they are coming from the back mind, they are coming from the unconscious where you have stored all your thoughts. Which thoughts have you stored? You have stored both. Bad thought affects you, you have stored its impression. Good thought affects you, you have stored your impression. You have not stored the impression of a thought, how many trees are there when you go to Holmesdale? There are, but you are not storing that thought. Those which are related to you in your daily life are those thoughts which are unpleasant and which are pleasant. So there are two types, two categories of thoughts. During that time you observe both. You are not identifying yourself. A time will come where all thoughts will be exhausted. But that is not all. You will have access to that storehouse, to that reservoir where you have stored these thought patterns unconscious. It means you have learned to expand your conscious mind. So normal person, normal human being has no access to the unconscious. And he has no access to the superconscious state beyond the unconscious. Christ had. Fortunate few great men had. it's a promise to all of us. If one human being has done something in the past, we can also do. Because we know human beings have done it. Such human beings, we call they are great men. Those who do not practice, we do not call them great. So no need of becoming great with the help of press publicity, because that is not going to help, please you or make you happy. I have seen all that from the age of three and a half. I lived with my master. People used to adore me in my childhood, you know. Everybody said, look at this avatara, you know. So my master in the evening used to say, you avatara, come over here. He used to, don't be affected by people's praises. You are a human being, you are a child, you know nothing, and they all call you avatara, it's bad for you. It's not good for your growth. I also learned a technique to see what happens to me, you know. I will create something simple so that you start hating me and then I'll see what you are saying against me. Is it affecting me? 
I'll tell you one example. You know Buddha, you all have heard about him. And he had a disciple called Ananda. Great disciple. So in the small town city of Rajgrahi, when Buddha went to with begging bowl, So during that time there were thousands of monks and it became difficult for the householder to give viksha, to give food to these monks. And gradually people left Rajgrahi. And there was no householder later on. But during that time there were few homes. And it's a usual routine in India and it's cultural, cultural something that when a monk comes to your door, you give him something to eat. The woman who was milking the cow got angry. Since morning I have been giving arms to these fellows, useless fellows, burdens to the country, burden to the nation, burden to themselves, and they are irresponsible doing nothing and they want viksha. It's not good. So she picked up the filth and started giving it to Buddha. You know Buddha always used to have a bowl and he smiled and said, Mother, keep it yourself. I didn't say anything. But Anand got angry and Anand said, You don't know my Lord, Master, great reincarnation, founder of the school of meditation, you are insulting. Buddha said, Quiet. If someone gives you something, please don't take it. Why are you angry? We are monks. We are beggars. If someone gives us something, it, it depends upon us whether we take it or not. You see? Learn this. When you, someone says something to you, it depends upon you whether you accept it or not. If someone says it's stupid to you, you feel very sad. It should be analyzed. If you are stupid, you have a chance to correct yourself. If you are not, why are you affected? You see. Those who are shallow, those who do not understand the mystery of life here and hereafter, are swayed by the praises. It's very dangerous for a sadhaka. If somebody says you are very good, thank you. Simple thank you, not the Western mantra. You know Western mantra? Thank you, thank you, sorry, sorry. You hit somebody and say sorry, and that's all. If somebody does a great favor to you, you say thank you. Whole day, how many times sorry and thank you do you say? I call them Western mantras. Remember this, if someone says something to you, don't accept it. Analyze. Is it right? If he is right or she is right, well, it's a chance for you to help yourself. If she or he is not right, why are you affected by this? Do not forget that you are a student throughout life. Till last breath of your life, you are a student who wants to learn. And life is learning. And in every walk of life you learn. So first practice is students should do. Anyone says something should not be affected. If you are pampered again and again, hundred people say you are bad and hundred people say you are good, what do you do? What is happening to you? You are feeding your ego. There is inside 
you there is something that is evil that is a deva both you are feeling that evil oh you are great you are great you are great you are great what that evil does that ego separates you from the whole So when you are separated from the whole, you have become an individual, small, tiny, many, little one. When you are separated from the whole, you have lost that majesty. You have become egotistical. So don't allow anyone to feed your ego. Don't become suspicious if somebody gives you compliment. It's okay. If somebody. speak some bad thing don't be affected these both unpleasant and pleasant reactions are stored in your mind and when you are trying to calm down your mind they come forward how about me how about this desire that i want to have a car One day, Maharaja of Varanasi, a city of learning, Banaras, on the other side is a state. So he came to my master and said, "Sir, whenever you come to Banaras, please visit us." He kept quiet. He said, "Got hold of my master's feet, please. Grace my residence." Third time, he said. Only one thing I want to do. He said, "Okay, I'll come." So we, when we went to Banaras, so there, there were instructions that we were going to come one day. Everybody was instructed to be nice to us and to. So the guard said, "Oh yes, yes, we have been. So please go inside." the manager said i am just calling secretary and secretary said i am calling pa finally when we went inside big courtyard and well furnished big hall we sat sat down there but uh, raja was missing so his servant come came personally and said sir he is in meditation he will be coming after 10 minutes my master laughed i said why are you laughing he was like my father you know so i said why are you laughing this is not good mannerism you know you are laughing here <laughs> he said you shut up so that stupid is not meditating he bought an elephant yesterday he is making a saddle it should be silver or it should be what what type of saddle it should have and all he is not meditating wasting his time so he came and said sir i am sorry i was meditating i said shut up you were not meditating yesterday you bought elephant is it yes Uh, you are preparing saddle for the, um, you see, elephant. Yes, <laughs> so is it was it meditation? That's what you do. Anything that you have to do, attend tomorrow, you think of it today, and you call it meditation. So there is something wrong with your process, with your system. So in the day-to-day life, learn to practice not to be affected by the praise and by the prejudice, by anything which is pleasant and unpleasant. One thing. You are that you are. You can transform yourself. Others only help and create hindrance, obstacles. when you have learned to observe your thinking process witness it i am different from my mind 
and you no more identify yourself with your mind. When you do not identify yourself with, it, with your mind, you are not affected by the creations of your mind, fear, anxiety, depression, sadness. Not at all. It's a meditation. The method of meditation is meant to give you freedom from all these which adversely affect you. Next sister. When you do not identify yourself with your thought patterns, a state of mind comes which is called super-conscious meditation. When you are sleeping, you do not know what happens during waking state. Now, during waking state, if you want to observe your sleeping state, you cannot do it, because you are not sleeping. When you are dreaming, you cannot know what sleep is and what waking state is. Superconscious state of mind is that state of mind from where you can observe all these three states, sleeping, dreaming and waking, yet you are above. That's a great state of mind. Now, there is no such departmental store from where you get such a thing. No matter how much money you spend, Yes, there is something that's called human efforts. Anyone who makes the sincere efforts can attain that state. Is there any person who can say that I don't have any fault, any weakness? No human being can say that. The thing which is truth in one place may be untruth in another place another time. The thing which is lawful in one place is unlawful in another place another time. You give money for your wife's gown, that's different. But if you give money to a prostitute, that, that is, to somebody who is not your wife, that is called prostitution. Act is the same. If you go on thinking, I am bad, I am bad, I am bad, you can never improve. That's why always there is something called prayer and repentance. Prayer alone does not help. Prayer and repentance purify the way of soul. And self-realization leads you to go. What is repentance? No need of repenting before others. They will make fool of you. Not to repeat is called repentance. If this thing is not accepted by the society, by others, I should not do it. Shankara said, Yadapi shuddham loka viruddham na karaniyam na chiraniyam. Though there is no harm, though it's good for you, for an individual, but don't do it if others do not appreciate it, others do not like it, others do not approve. To do not repeat is called repentance. Anything that you think is odd, do not repeat it. You are free from that. Prayer. For whom will you pray? To whom will you pray? Remember that there are two sorts of prayers. Egotistical prayer and God-centric prayer. Egocentric prayer, God-centric prayer. You don't remember God, but whenever there is something you want, you say, oh Lord, give me. What do you make out of yourself? You are making a beggar out of yourself. How weak do you become when you ask for something? 
no matter who he is. All the time you ask God, give me this, God, give me this, God, give me and you get it. What do you become? What are you? Who are you? You are a beggar. All the time you are asking. And what are you feeding? Ego. You are becoming selfish, selfish, selfish. In God-centered prayer, you don't ask. You get it, you receive it. Without asking. What do you say? Oh Lord, give me that strength so that I can go through this, through thick and thin. I can pass through this procession of life. So what you need? Inner strength. Inner strength will come when you will learn to build your willpower gradually. Next step comes when you have become a shrine. All the religions say the gist is one and the same. All the religions are given by one and one absolute who is called God. And all the religions declare that God is omnipresent, omniscient and omnipotent. We should understand, where are we then? If he is everywhere, where am I? Either I don't exist, or if at all I exist, I exist in God. And God exists in me. So this is a creation of my mind that I am different from God and God is not in me. Oh, this mind is not good. It should be trained, it should be purified. So philosophically, you should understand that God is in me, I am his shrine. Do you make that, that shrine dirty? No. You keep that shrine clean and neat, within and without. Because it's a shrine of the Lord. When you learn to understand that shrine is within me, then you are free. Lord is there. I am with the Lord. You see? Then there are steps of realization. God exists. It means you are, you exist and God also exists. And there is no change in you. There is a solace. But you will be you and God will be God. There is no change. You are not free from the misery. You go closer to the Lord and say, Yes, Lord is with me. I am with the Lord. This is the second step. Third step, as Christ said, I and my Father are one. That oneness you establish, you see, not by denying yourself, but exactly the way when river meets the ocean, river does not lose its existence but becomes the ocean. It's expansion of the river. These are the benefits of meditation. But go according to schedule. If child cries, you get up and say, I could not sit in meditation because my child cried today. Next day you will find the husband cried. If he doesn't, doesn't cry, shout. Third day you will find the friends cry, neighbors cry. Choose a time for yourself when you have not to do your worldly duties. Nobody wakes you up at night and says, are you sleeping? You can meditate when everyone is sleeping. So when I lived with my master, thousands of people used to come. Everybody used to put flour and some coconut and this and this and money. 
And that child, you know, four years old, I said, there is something unusual in me that everybody is bringing and other children are being deprived. So I started feeling that I am someone. So my master said, no, you are nothing stupid. I said, if people praise you and say you are great, it's their greatness, not yours. I'll tell you one thing. There was one tiny state in India, Hyderabad. So there was one man called Chandu. He was very favorite of the Maharaja. He's a very good man. He wouldn't retire without giving charities. He was so famous, nobody knew about Nawab of Hyderabad, Maharaja of Hyderabad. But everybody knew about Chandu who Chandu was, because of his generosity, because of his, you see, greatness. So everybody used to call, oh, Chandu is Hyderabad, Chandu is Hyderabad. So one day Nawab called him, Chandu, what's this? I am Nawab, this state belongs to me, why people say Chandu is Hyderabad? <laughs> you know what did he say? Khuda ki shan hai insan ka mashur. It's Lord's grace that you are known to many people. Don't think that it's your grace. Don't think that you are great. So again and again I was taught. People are good, people are wonderful, people are loving, they are giving you this. You have not earned, you have not done anything. Be humble, be humble, be humble. In your daily life, be nice, be gentle, be humble. But don't allow anyone to hurt you. Have that inner strength. That meditation which you practice, then that is brought forward as meditation in action. Five minutes if you meditate and rest of the day you become monster, that's not a good meditation. That meditation which makes you aware of the reality within you, should not be forgotten when you do your actions. All my thoughts, all my actions, all my speech should be directed towards that awareness. Wherever you go, remember, Lord within you. Someone is witnessing your actions, your speech. And life becomes a poem, a poetry, and a song, and you enjoy. And that's what life is. You know what life is? A camp. And we are in a journey. This is a camp. This is not your home. We are going through this camp. We have to go. We all will have to go. If we have come and we are going, it means we are on journey. This journey should be pleasant. Don't get attached to this world, for the world is not your home. Yes, learn this world as a resting place and then you have to go ahead. So no harm loving, but a great harm in being attached. There is a difference between attachment and love. Learn to love all and exclude none. That is the way to divine peace, peace, peace. God bless you.